thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, if you don't know already, my name is Meredith Kwok. I am the Associate Director of Constituent Relations for the Program in Public Health. Thank you for joining us for the final and bonus episode of the UCI Public Health Lunchtime Lecture Series. For those who have joined us all five weeks, thank you so much for your support of this series and for allowing us to highlight the important work of our faculty here at UCI. All of course in an easy to digest manner if you're joining us with your lunch. Um, as I've mentioned before, this is a critical time for public health in many ways on a global level and also on a campus level as our program transitions into a school. So much has changed in our world and society since we have last met and I know the current climate of our country will spark some interesting conversation today. So without further ado, um, thank you to Dr. Andrew Neuamer, Associate Professor in Public Health at UC Irvine for returning to this series, backed by popular demand. Um, Dr. Neuamer will give a brief introduction and then we'll be using all of our time together for a Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature um, on the bottom toolbar, not the chat, the Q&A, and please start submitting your questions now and Dr. Neuamer will answer as many as possible. So with that, I pass it to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Meredith, and thank. Uh, and I'd like to echo your your thanks to all the audience members for for joining us, and thank you for supporting UCI Public Health, and uh, and thank you for your interest in in what we're doing uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned. Let me just quickly uh, share a screen while you while you're typing your questions for me. This is going to be mostly Q and A, but I just want to share a, 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 a graph with you. And okay, I hope uh, you can see that this is a time series graph of age standardized death rate for influenza and pneumonia combined for the United States uh, for men and women from 1959 through the end of 2015 calendar years. And you can see uh, a nice um, sort of uh, almost sine wave uh, you know, like regularity of the seasonality of, uh, of influenza mortality. And there's two lab labels here, here, A and B, and these are flu pandemics. Uh, and, and you can see the 1968-69 flu pandemic, the so-called Hong Kong flu here, which I'm, so, I'm sort of moving my mouse over it, I guess. You can see it better if I do, if I do this. And uh, it, it wasn't that much bigger, in, in fact, in the preceding flu season in terms of mortality. So, you, you know, the, the prior experience with, with flu pandemics is, isn't that they're necessarily super deadly. Um, and, but um, the other thing I want to show you is, uh, is the more recent one, the, the H1N1, this one that's labeled B, the H1N1, uh, so-called swine flu pandemic of 2009. Uh, you'll see what hap that this sine wave here has a really funny shape. It has these weird shoulders. It's not really a, a nice um, big, uh, it's not a nice sort of smooth wave like this one here on to, to its right. It's just sort of this weird plateau. And now why is that? And that is, be and, and you'll also notice that what, that it's not very elevated. So that, that flu pandemic was not very deadly, which is, I think one of the reasons why we, uh, we're so unprepared for COVID-19 because our, our most recent experience with the pandemic was that it was kind of uh, not, not that big a deal. But there is some signal here. And, and what that's showing us is that the seasonality uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, influenza was sort of interrupted in this period. The, the 2008, 2009 flu season has this funny shoulder uh, on it, and that's because it extended. And why? Did it, because the flu uh, emerged in April of 2009. So that just as that flu season was sort of winding down, it it uh, it it got extended, and we see that the summer was a little bit elevated relative to other summers, although it's not not you know very profound. And then and then that we see that the 2009 slash 10 flu season started super early. And this is seasonality. And we see this with almost every respiratory disease. And we see it so profoundly with flu because, uh, because 
of cross immunity. So during the summertime, flu really loses its umph. And so the, the, the million dollar question now is, will COVID-19 be seasonal and, or, or will it just keep bulldozing through the summertime? And the answer is, you know, that we don't really know yet, but, um, you know, and people keep asking me this and, and we don't really know yet. And, you know, if it bulldozes through the summertime, the bad news is that we're gonna have more COVID all summer long. And I know for obvious reasons, COVID has been less in the news in the last uh, 10 days or so, but uh, there, there still is uh, a significant amount of, of COVID in the country. Uh, the ICU numbers are up nationwide and ICU numbers are up here in Orange County. Uh, and if, it, if we get more of a summer break from COVID, I, I do anticipate seeing definitely a, a fall wave. And that flu graph I just finished showing you is sort of an example of what I'm expecting. I'm expecting an early wave. So that, uh, that flu mortality in, in the fall of 2009 really started picking up uh, in, in October. And so I would expect more COVID by October. Uh, the only thing that would really save us from that would be is if there's no seasonality effect. And that, but that would mean that, we, that we're gonna continue to have significant COVID over the summer. So it's like kind of the frying pan or the fire, if you will. So I just wanted to mention that because we didn't talk as much about that last time. And, but that's the only slide I'll have prepared for you. So let me see, there's two questions. Uh, so this, the, the first question is actually very related to the point I was just making about a second lockdown. That is difficult to answer, but I, I think um, if, if, the, if, the, if the novelty of the COVID virus that we are uh, seeing over the, um, uh, that we're seeing now, it causes it to just bulldoze the, the, the uh, seasonal effects so that there isn't really a strong seasonality. That will mean that we'll have COVID all summer long. And I, I think that will mean that there won't be a second lockdown because by the time we reach the fall, um, you know, we'll be closer to herd immunity. And although we'll be closer to herd immunity, you know, obviously the, the hard way, but you know, in the USA, there have been, you know, around 12,000 confirmed cases to date, and there's probably 10 times that many in actuality. So there's, there's probably, uh, pardon me, 12 million. Uh, oh, no, 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 cases, I was looking at the wrong number. So uh, two, 2 million confirmed cases, I was looking at the uh, new cases, which is around 12,000. There, there's, there's, we're creeping up around 2 million confirmed cases. So there'll probably in actuality be 20 million um, confirmed, uh, 20 million true cases and uh, infections. And so, you know, uh, we, we, you know, by, by September, we could be at 40% of the population having some sort of at least temporary immunity. Uh, so that would make a fall, um, a second shutdown less likely, but it would mean we have COVID all summer long. And if we have, if we have a, a strong diminution of COVID as we move into the summer, then I think that that number will grow, the number already infected will grow much slower, meaning the fall wave will be more profound. And, I, and under those circumstances, I think a second lockdown, so-called lockdown, uh, won't be avoidable, at least from a policy point of view. I don't know whether there's any appetite for that right now. And uh, I, I think people are, uh, for better or for worse, more and more willing to make trade-offs, uh, you know, and trade-offs involve, um, you know, no lockdown, but also involve, uh, um, you know, more, more deaths. I mean, more cases and more deaths. Uh, so pr what are immediate improvements to our health care that can help battle infection like this in the future? That's an excellent question. Uh, that's from Cameron. So one thing that I alluded to is that, um, is that the, uh, the 2009 pan pandemic really kind of lulled us to sleep because the 2009 pandemic was not a severe event. It was a pandemic. It was a worldwide spread of a novel strain of, in this case, influenza, but it, it, it was not severe. It didn't kill a lot of people and it didn't even, you know, send up, fill up the ICUs. So 
you know, in the early 2000s, there were all these bird flu scares. There were these worries that we were going to have uh, an outbreak of, of bird flu uh, because there were some novel strains of bird flu floating around and so, some of these showed capacity to infect humans. And so um, there, were, there was all this preparation for a pandemic and there were these national pandemic plans that governments came up with, including the United States government. And then what happened was the 2009 pandemic really came. And unlike the bird flu, you know, uh, scares, it was a real pandemic. And, but the thing is, as I said, it was not severe. So people were like, oh, these pandemics are just nothing. And, you know, then this came. And, so, and I think we were very unprepared. So the first thing is to be more prepared. And people say, well, this is a, a black swan event and we couldn't have anticipated it. I don't know if, if, you, if you know this book by Nassim Taleb called The Black Swan, but it, it wasn't a black swan event because black swan events are, are, are events that you can't expect. And this was an event that we did expect. We have national pandemic plans. If you have a, if you have a book on the shelf that, or a, a binder on the shelf that's labeled pandemic plan, then it's not a black swan because that means you're anticipating it. I mean, maybe you did a, a, a poor job anticipating, or, or maybe your pandemic plan was poor, but if you had a pandemic plan, then it's not a black swan. So what we need to do is, is revamp our pandemic plans and make them more thorough. I mean, hospitals were begging for PPE. I mean, hospitals shouldn't be begging for PPE. Hospitals should have a storage locker in some industrial part of town, you know, one of the, you know, filled to the brim with PPE. I mean, the stuff doesn't go bad. And, and you know, and the hospitals didn't have that and because they were, you know, they were begging for them. So, uh, you know, and I think the PPE situation has stabilized and I think the clinics have what they need now. But the point is we need to do a better job preparing. We need to, to, uh, to learn um, from, from this uh, in, in terms of just being more prepared. Um, so let's see, Orange, here's a question. Uh, from an anonymous questioner. In your opinion, has Orange County opened up too fast? Most retail stores and restaurants are now open with dine-in, uh, gyms, hair salons, uh, even Disneyland is set to open in July. Uh, so I understand that we cannot keep the economy closed forever. Are we going too fast? Yes, that is my opinion. So we, we cannot stay locked down forever. And I do not believe we should stay locked down entirely. Now, we should be opening. Absolutely, we should be opening. I mean, people are, uh, are just not gonna uh, tolerate uh, being told to, uh, to stay at home all the time when, when the pandemic hasn't been, you know, uh, as severe as we feared. And another question is, why are we locking down? Well, that's a good, why are we locking down? We're locking down, you know, principally to prevent a, a Lombardy style, you know, Northern Italy style hospital crush where COVID patients are filling up the hospital and, you know, other people can't even get care for their, you know, hernia or appendicitis or, or, what, or you know, or what have you. Um, and, and so, but we have done that. Orange County hospitals are not crushed. If, if you have an appendicitis right now, you can go to the hospital and they'll take care of it, which is good. So why are we locking down then? Well, we shouldn't be locked down forever. You know, we're locking down to wait for a vaccine is, is, is not gonna work. It's a too long a wait. So we should be opening up, but I agree with the questioner that we are opening up too quickly because we, we still don't know if we're playing with fire here. Some of these ICU increases, you know, this, these are cases that were infected before the current um, protest landscape. The, these are not people who became infected um, during the, uh, during the uh, protests. Um, so this is, this is because we're, as a nation, we're opening up. And in my opinion, slightly too quickly. I'm not an advocate for, you know, continuing to stay locked down entirely, but we need to open up slowly. And I've said on many occasions that we need to stagger things by 10 days so that we can take a wait and see approach. Why 10, at least 10 days is what I have said. Why at least 10 days? Because the serial interval is five to 10 days. That means if I become infected today, it takes between five to 10 days before I can infect someone else. So opening up uh, barbershops on, on Tuesday and other uh, hair salons on Wednesday and restaurants on Thursday and gyms on Friday, that's too quick. You know, we don't know yet if the barbershops are, you know, causing problems. So 
uh, we need to open up businesses in waves uh, and, uh, and keep a close eye. And I think we're not doing that. In fact, um, you know, restaurants have, as you pointed out, have been open. So yes, I, I think we're moving too fast. We're doing the right thing. I am not in favor of absolute lockdown, but we're, we are moving slightly too fast. Yesterday, the Orange County numbers were not very pretty uh, in terms of there were uh, 120 cases in the ICU. Um, and today's numbers have not been released yet, but 120 cases is a lot in, in Orange County in the ICU. So um, that worries me. So uh, so here's, uh, uh, so thank you for that question. There's another question. How have past pandemics and uh, social isolation changed our immune system? Well, past pandemics have, uh, for influenza, have changed our immune system a lot in terms of influenza. Um, you can see immune imprinting in cohort effects of influenza mortality. So in the 2009 flu pandemic, um, older folks so uh, died basically at normal rates. Like people 85 plus and 75 plus died at normal rates. The people who died at elevated rates were people in their 40s. Now you may say, well, people in their 40s hardly ever die of influenza, and that's true. And that's why that pandemic was kind of a nothing burger because if you take a very, 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 very low death rate, which is the normal death rate for people in their 40s, and you multiply it by a factor of two, you get out still a number that's very, very, very small because people in their 40s typically don't die, and they certainly typically don't die of influenza. So there is a detectable signal there, but, it's in, it's, but the whole pandemic was kind of a nothing burger because it happened um, among people at younger ages. Now, why was that? It's because older people were alive before 1957. And that, that means that, that their immune experience with influenza was based on H1N1. Because from 1918, when H1N1 emerged in the great so-called Spanish flu pandemic, until 1957, when it was displaced by H2N2 in the so-called Asian flu epidemic, the, the, the major strain, the only circulating strain of, H, of, of influenza A was H1N1. So all the sen senior citizens have strong immunity to H1N1 because they have natural immunity to H1N1. And so their mortality in 2009 was not increased. And so past pandemics shape our uh, immune response in many ways that are measurable. And that are, the thing is, immunity is very specific. So flu antibodies that I've just been describing don't give us any protection against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's not even clear how much uh, protection that the other coronaviruses give us against SARS-CoV-2. So, uh, you know, uh, we have to take the current uh, pandemic very seriously because, um, you know, there hasn't been a, a pa any past pandemics of SARS of, of coronaviruses. The 2003 outbreak, which affected um, principally China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Canada uh, is not really a pandemic. I mean, and I doubt very many people on this call, if anyone uh, was uh, affected directly by, in terms of infection, by the 2003 strain. So, uh, you know, that's the problem. This is a new pandemic of a very new disease. All the flu antibodies that we have in our system be it because we had flu two years ago, or be it because we, we you know, get the flu shot every fall, those flu antibodies are, don't help us. And so you know, we're in sort of new territory and we're, we're still learning more about, uh, it doesn't seem that the previous coronaviruses give very much immune protection. They, they may actually help, they may actually hinder our uh, ability to do tests. They may give us too high false positive rates but it's not clear that where the rubber meets the road, they give us uh, meaningful immune protection, although it's not impossible either. Um, and the stay at home isolation is another aspect of the question. How has stay at home influenced uh, immune systems? Well, uh, that's a, another excellent question. So the immune, um, uh, you know, we're trying, I have some Twitter threads about this. And if you're interested in my sort of thoughts of the day on COVID, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Andrew Neumer. But 
the um, you know we people have criticized the so-called herd immunity uh, strategy, which means we have a very light touch and on isolation, and we uh, we just let people get it, get immune, uh, immunity. And uh, people have rightfully criticized that, but every strategy in, in, in some sense is a herd immunity strategy. We're, we're trying to get to herd immunity. The best way would be a vaccine, but we don't have one yet. So let's talk about other ways. You know, getting people to survive low dose natural infection with as little mortality as possible is the other, is the other way. And, and so, if we uh, so locking down is meant to achieve that, but it's meant, but but that's partly also why we need to open up a little bit because we uh, will never get herd immunity if we all just stay locked in our basement uh, for the next four years or whatever. So uh, you know, if we go out, we can mask, and that might help because you know people people keep saying that masks aren't perfect. That is kind of the whole point here. If, if you mask, you're much likely to get a smaller dose and do, through dose response, you're much, much likely to get a, sm a less severe infection. So you'll be at home in bed for a week instead of in the hospital for two weeks. Well, guess what? At the end of either of those scenarios, you'll be immune. But wouldn't you rather be immune after being homesick in bed for a week than rather than being in the hospital for two weeks? Yes, and giving yourself a lower, um, in, uh, infectious dose might just achieve that. And that's why masking is so is so called for, but also don't worry about the people who say that masks aren't perfect. It doesn't, they don't need to be perfect. Um, is, there, is there any danger in this novel virus mutating into more dangerous virus, David asks. Uh, yes, but I, uh, I actually think that the viruses and their, uh, their hosts tend to co-evolve towards less virulence. So we saw that in 1918. The 1918 flu went away. There was no vaccine. The, the 1918 flu became the 1919 through 1957 regular seasonal flu, and then it was and then it vanished uh, in 1957 when the H2N2 emerged. So uh, there is a, there is a small danger in in gain of function mutation, but uh, those mutations tend to die out uh, because they kill their hosts too quickly. So um, there's also a prospect of, of this becoming uh, a less severe infection. Um, how reliable are, Luis asks, how reliable are testing numbers in the US, California, and Orange County? Um, do I feel that testing is underreported, overreported, or about right? I mean, I think the reporting of the testing is, uh, is probably pretty accurate. In some cases, I think there's not enough testing being done. In other cases, I think there is probably enough testing being done, actually. Um, you know, in Orange County, we've done 140,000 tests to date, uh, as of yesterday's data. Uh, th that's actually qu quite a bit. I mean, I think there is room for improvement, but uh, it's, it's not so bad. Um, and the, the testing numbers are coming up around 4%. Uh, as every uh, positive, as every batch is reported on a daily basis, the last week or so have been running around 4%. The rule of thumb is that if you're testing at 10% or more, uh, that you're, you really, you're really under testing because you, you, you need to test more because you'll find more case, a lot more cases. And we're well under that. Now, that's not an a epidemiological law. It's just kind of a rule of thumb. So, uh, you know, take it for what, for what it is. But I think, I think the number, the amount of testing... Um, in, uh, in Orange County is, is actually about right. I mean, I think um, what does worry me in Orange County is, and, is that uh, Santa Ana and Anaheim have 37% uh, of all the confirmed cases uh, to date. And, um, and they have only 21% of the county population. So there's a lot of inequities in where the cases are showing up. And I, I think that has to do with people going back to work and getting exposed um, that way. And so, my biggest concern is that people who need tests should get them. And it's a little bit hard to read those tea leaves from just the aggregate numbers. But um, I, the testing situation is getting better, but we, um, as, 
we need to do test and trace, which is where we need to then start asking people, who have you come into contact with? So that, that's how we can sort of get the upper hand on this, is not only through testing, but testing and tracing. Now, here's a question from Cameron uh, with a strong number of protests. So uh, will we see a, you know, a worsening in the situation? Um, I actually am cautiously optimistic that the protests won't cause a major spike. But I think no, the answer is nobody knows. And let me say why I'm cautiously optimistic that it won't cause a major spike. Um, the people who protest are doing so outside. Uh, they're, in my observation, based on uh, media coverage, they're doing so with masks, and they're mostly young and healthy people. So I think, uh, you know, um, the amount of spread of COVID-19 associated with the protests has the capacity to be modest. Do I know that for sure? No. Am I saying there won't be any spread? Absolutely not. There has to be spread. Any kind of group activity will cause spread. That's just the, the world we're living in right now. Will it cause a major spike? I, am, I don't think so for the reasons I enumerated, but you know, wait, let's wait and see. So here's a, uh, a question. Uh, uh, from Lisa, I work as a nurse. I'm wearing N95 during patient visits. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, N95 is your, is your best defense. Uh, some sort of eye protection, if you, if you uh, can as well. Um, I, uh, I still wear carpenter's uh, protective goggles over my regular corrective lenses. When, I, when I'm in situations where I am around a lot of other people, that prevents droplets from landing on my eye uh, and infecting my respiratory tract through the tear ducts. Um, and uh, clinicians should probably be wearing the plastic facial shields, but N95 is, is where it's at. And the infection rates among clinicians are, qu are quite low. So, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, th I think you know, obviously gloves, but and hand wash, hand sanitation, in, in addition. But I mean, I mean, I mean, clinicians seem to be doing okay at protecting themselves. So f follow the protocols. But N95 plus some sort of eye protection is is definitely where it's at. And you don't need like a you know one of those like a scuba scuba suit or anything like, like that. Uh, if achieved, how long would herd immunity last? Asks uh, an anonymous questioner. Uh, that is a complicated question. Herd immunity. Uh, is a population uh, phenomenon. And so herd immunity gets chipped away by new birth cohorts aging into susceptibility. So uh, that's why you have measles epidemics. Well, before there was a vaccine in the 1950s, you have measles epidemics once every two years because it takes a while to accumulate new, in the case of measles, it's always kids because adults had it when they were kids. But so it's, it's births, 4 million births a year in the US that cause uh, herd immunity to wane because you have all these new people. So it's, it's uh, but it, it's, the, the answer is herd immunity wanes slowly. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, Meredith, have I been keeping up with the, the questions? Uh, is... You've done a great job and got to almost all of them, but I hate to cut this short. Um, we are at our one o'clock mark. So I've added Dr. Neumer's um, Twitter handle into the chat. So please do follow and connect with him there. Um, I can speak for you and say that you're very active and responsive on Twitter. Yes, if you if you ask me a question, just uh, just at me on Twitter and use a hashtag like whatever UCI lunchtime series or something, and I'll I'll, I'll answer your your question, um, you know, on 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 social media. How about that? That's a great idea, and I'll add that hashtag into the follow up email. So as always, I am releasing a very short poll. Um, this is, like I said, our very last of the series, but please do continue to keep in touch and keep an eye out for upcoming projects and programs from the program in public health and soon to be school of population and public health. So thank you, Dr. Neumer, for your time. Again, we're so lucky to have you as an expert right here on our very own campus at UCI. Um, in the follow-up email, you'll find more links on information and ways to support the program in public health and the research of our faculty and a recording of this lecture and all the past. So who knows, maybe we'll be back 
again in a few weeks, a month, as things continue to evolve and change. But um, now more than ever, please be well, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for supporting public health, everybody, and, uh, and stay safe and be well. Thank you. Take care, everyone.